Well, welcome back to the Wellness Paradox. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Allison Mankowski. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to get in this discussion. One, Allison is a U of M alum, which is always delightful to chat with another U of M alum, but she's also here to talk about a very important area of potential collaboration for fitness and wellness professionals, uh, which is with dietetic professionals. And before we jump into that discussion, why don't you give us a little bit more of an idea of your background just to provide some context? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like you said, I am a U of M alum two times over. So go blue. Um, go blue. Getting excited about the game on, on Saturday. And my husband is a state grad. So even though we don't technically have bragging rights, we're playing a week longer. So I feel excited about that. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I graduated from school of kinesiology movement science major in 2007. Um, I actually originally was a, a PT, pre-PT plan um, until I worked in a clinic and decided that was not the route that I wanted to go. So luckily was able to switch over pretty pretty quickly summer before my senior year and, and went to the School of um, Public Health, got my degree in human nutrition, did my dietetic internship, um, came out in 2010 and um, kind of always knew I wanted to go into sports nutrition. That was kind of my, my long-term plan. I got very fortunate to be hired as the sports dietitian at Eastern um, about a year after I finished. So that was pretty exciting. Um, however, it was part-time. So while I was doing that, I kind of worked um, in various different kind of community nutrition programs um, kind of off and on throughout the years um, until I started my own practice in 2017. And then I was able to kind of do Eastern and, and my private practice. Um, Originally in my private practice, I kind of did a, a whole host of things, everything from weight management um, to you know eating disorder recovery. I partnered with um, a handful of local gyms, kind of did some nutrition um, counseling and programs for different you know clientele there. Um, and then just in the last year or so, I've really kind of narrowed my focus in my private practice. I'm mostly now working with athletes who are working on eating disorder recovery. So that's the bulk of my practice. Um, still definitely focused in that sports nutrition realm, but kind of kind of narrowing it down a little bit. I'm still at Eastern, um, not quite full time, um, but but close to um, working with the athletes there as well. So. Cool. And, and I'll point out that when, when Allison says Eastern, she means Eastern Michigan University. For those of yes. you that are, are not from the Washtenaw County area, this is a university that's, oh, I don't know, about 15 minutes to the east of, of University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And Allison, I love your, your diverse background because you've done a lot of things and it sounds like you've really settled into a nice space working with you know eating disorder recovery and athletes, which mm -hmm. is a topic I think that we might touch on a little bit towards the, the tail end of this podcast, but I think the reason I was most interested to talk with you is that you have had collaborations with gyms and fitness centers and with fitness mm -hmm. professionals. And this seems like a time where collaboration has never been more important in all of the health sciences. And I'd like you to speak a little bit on why it's so important for this collaboration to exist between dietetics professionals and fitness and wellness professionals. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think the obvious answer is, you know, everybody knows nutrition matters when mm -hmm. it comes to fitness, when it comes to wellness, nutrition is a huge chunk of that. Um, I, I won't be too biased and say it's maybe the biggest chunk, but, um, but it's, it's, it's really important. I don't think anybody, you know, argues that. Um, I think, you know, one thing that really comes to mind is that, you know, interest in nutrition is growing. I think people are more and more willing to, you know, examine their own nutrition behaviors, um, think about nutrition. Um, but even though that's happening, I don't think a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to go out and get a dietitian. You know, that's mm -hmm. not usually their first thought. Um, their first thought is let me do some research on the internet. Um, let me, you know, talk to my fitness professional that I'm working with. Um, and so by us collaborating, that opens the door, right? Um, when fitness and wellness professionals can tell their clients, hey, you know, I'm glad you're interested in this. Here's a list of dietitians you should go talk to, right? Um, so it really can kind of open that door um, to something that, you know, most people think of, okay, a dietitian is someone I see in the hospital when I have diabetes. Um, and they don't realize that there's a lot of people out there working in that, you know, kind of general, um, general wellness space um, that, that can be really helpful for them. Yeah, it is interesting. And, and, and it strikes me as unfortunate that the the gateway to get to dietitians doesn't seem to be very well established outside of the 
you know, cardiometabolic pathology. And, and even in that structure, it's not like you get to spend a lot of time with the, the dietitian. Uh, talk for a, a second on that. Why do you think when somebody's considering improving their health, they might consider a, a personal trainer or a wellness coach more so than a dietitian? I find that interesting. Yeah, it, it's funny because I actually as I was, you know, thinking about what to talk about, I had a note about that. And, you know, so I'm glad you kind of fed right, right into that. Um, you know, I think it's a lot like mental health where, you know, a lot of people think, okay, I, I don't need to see a therapist. I'm fine. I can, I can fix this on my own. Right. Um, and I think nutrition kind of falls into that. They think unless something's wrong, you know, or very wrong or very obviously wrong, um, that, that they should be able to just do it. Right. They can, they can research, they can figure it out. There's so much information out there, which is a whole nother, yeah. whole nother issue. Right. Um, so most people I think don't realize that, you know, it's, it's worthwhile to talk to someone and, you know, they kind of feel like I can just handle this. Um, I don't, I don't have anything wrong with me. So, uh, you know, I don't need to do this kind of thing. Yeah. I, it's, you make an interesting parallel to mental health. Now, I think one area that people tend to conflate in this process is you hear about nutritionists and then you hear about dietitians. And you and I both know there is a clinical distinction there, but I think before even going further in this discussion, we need to make sure that people are crystal clear on what a nutritionist is and how they're schooled versus how a, a dietetics professional who's a registered dietitian is schooled. Yeah, that's a um, very important distinction there. And, you know, most dietitians um, kind of have that like internal cringe when, when someone calls them a, a nutritionist and not that there's anything wrong with somebody who calls themselves a nutritionist and is doing the work to, you know, learn about it. But um, the distinction there is really a dietitian, you know, the path um, is, you know, schooling, which actually starting in, in a year, um, uh, master's level is going to be necessary, right? So um, soon, everybody who's a dietitian will have a master's degree. Um, and then after that, um, they have to do uh, anywhere from you know, eight to 12 month rotations, um, clinical internships. So they're going through and getting the experience in the hospital with all of the medical nutrition therapy and in long-term care and in food service and in counseling. And um, so they really, you know, have multiple years, you know, four, six years of schooling and then another year of, of internships. And then they sit for their exam and then they have to maintain their credentials. Um, so 75 hours every five years that they're putting in, you know, to make sure they're staying up to date with everything. So um, nutritionists, on the other hand, doesn't have a distinction, really. Um, I mean, there's a, a ton of, you know, certificates that people can get and online trainings and, you know, all of that. Um, really, honestly, anybody could just say, I'm a nutritionist. Um, they don't even have to have, have to have any of that training, um, although many do. So um, pretty big difference in, in the training there. Yeah, exactly. And I'm glad that's why we talked about it, because I think the vast majority of certainly the general public, but I even think fitness and wellness professionals will use those terms interchangeably. And there is a, a massive, massive clinical distinction. And to your point, my mom, I love my mom, but my mom has her views on nutrition and she could call herself a nutritionist, but she has those views and there, yeah. there's no clinical distinction to that. And I think that's important. And it leads me to my next question around scope of practice. And this is a very, very common conversation, I think, in all of the allied health fields, but it becomes a little blurry with nutrition because everyone has a belief and opinion on nutrition from things as simple as the foods you like to, hey, the ketogenic diet is something that really works well for you. Fitness and wellness professionals are put in this very interesting position where I think there's an unspoken expectation in some cases, but sometimes it's even a spoken expectation that, hey, you're going to help me, let's say, lose weight as an example. Therefore, you're going to help me with my exercise plan to do that and my nutrition plan to do that. I do think there is something in the fitness professional, wellness professional scope of practice that allows them to talk a little bit about nutrition, but where does that stop and where does that start? Yeah, I think that's a really challenging question. Um, and I think gets a little bit, um, a little bit heated sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I know I have worked with, I've worked with many wonderful, um, fitness and wellness professionals who, who understand that line. I've also worked with a couple who did not appreciate my views and did not agree with my views. And, and, you know, um, so I think it gets tricky, right? Um, I, I totally agree. There's absolutely situations where, again, the fitness and wellness professional might be the first, first person who they're kind of coming to. And you can absolutely talk about 
Are you fueling enough? Are you getting food to come in here and do the work that we're putting through? Are you getting enough fruits and vegetables? Are you drinking your water? I mean, those, those very basic things that, you know, I think everybody knows are important um, to yeah. wellness. Are you paying attention to your nutrition? Cause yeah, that, that does have to be a thing. Right. Um, you know, and I don't think there's any question that, you know, if somebody has a diagnosis like, you know, diabetes or heart disease or any of those that, you know, I think everybody knows that's send it off territory, right. That's referred out. Um, but then that middle ground, right. Um, gets fuzzy and, you know, in my opinion, I really think that even things like offering a macro plan or offering a calorie plan or um, recommending specific diets like the keto diet or, or whatever, I think that veers into outside of the scope of practice. And um, really, you know, where that comes from is there's calculators, of course, it does not take, uh, you know, six years of schooling to punch in height, weight, activity level and get a calorie recommendation, right? Um, but the tricky part with that is that, you know, creating a plan is much more than just handing over numbers um, or handing over macros or whatever it might be, um, or saying stay away from this food group or whatever, um, because nobody's a robot. <laughs> so, you know, the, those, those calculations can get you a starting point. But after that, I really feel like it becomes a little bit more of an art than a science, right? Um, where you have to do some trial and error and you have to test and you have to, you know, play around with that. Um, and then that's not even touching on the bigger piece, which, you know, I'm, I, I know is very close to my heart in the health, um, you know, health of this person from the mental perspective, right? Um, what's their relationship with food? What barriers do they have at home? Um, are you really sitting down and, and counseling this person um, to understand that, right? Um, if you hand somebody calories and macros, that could be triggering and that could set them up for, you know, a downslide um, from the mental health perspective and, you know, damage their relationship with food. And so there's a lot of other kind of fine, you know, details in there that, um, that are really tricky. And that's, I mean, that's what we're trained to do, right. Is to, to recognize and notice, um, if those are coming into play and to know how to navigate that. Yeah. The, the devil is always in the details and, and I completely agree on, and the extreme ends of the spectrum. I think it's pretty straightforward. You have a clinical condition dietitian, you are just looking to eat healthy, uh, probably something my mom could counsel you on within our scope in between it, it is, it is a very, very, uh, fine line. It's, it's very blurred. Uh, I think you know, what comes to my mind when I think about this as well, and I'd be curious for you to speak on this a little bit, and it'll, it'll lead into a larger question, but I've always thought that to counsel somebody properly with regard to nutrition takes a lot of time. And fitness professionals and, and wellness professionals, that's not actually what they're being paid for. Like if you have to develop someone's exercise plan, let's just say, and take them through those workouts, that's most of the time that you're getting paid for, for that person. So how are you spending all this other time? It, it would almost seem to me, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on it, that that'd be time that you would be spending that you're not getting paid for. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, I can say that, you know, my initial assessment with someone, when I meet with them for the first time, it takes me about an hour and a half yeah. to, to run through every question that I need to make sure that what I'm recommending fits and is appropriate. And, you know, I tell them right up front at that plan, like, I, I don't even know what to tell you yet because we have to ask all these questions and I have to look into this from a deeper perspective because what worked for my person before you is not going to work for you potentially. And um, I mean, that's just the first session. And then, you know, we're seeing each other every other week for 45 minutes where I'm asking more questions and I'm digging into what worked and what didn't work. And I mean, exactly what you said, right? Like that, you don't have time for that, right? Like, um, you know, that's, you guys got many other pieces um, that you got to take care of, so. Yeah, and you actually took that exactly in the direction that I, I wanted you to take it, but I'd like to have you unpack it a little bit more. Help people understand your process. And maybe if you can abstract yeah. it a little bit away from athletes towards just like a, a regular adult, uh, general population client, it, what, let us look under the hood. Like, what is this actually looking like when you're working with somebody? Yeah. So I'll kind of like give you a little run through of what my, you know, initial appointment looks like. Um, you know, we start at the very beginning of, okay, you know, what are your goals, right? You're here. Why are you here to see me? Right. So that's kind of basic, obviously, um, figuring out, making sure we're on the same page. Um, and then from there we talk about, okay, what, what's your weight history? And 
that's a whole topic that, you know, I could probably dig into. I don't like to focus a ton on weight, but it's important for me to kind of understand, have you tried to change your weight in the past? Have you, you know, done it in ways that are maybe not so great for your mental or physical health? And, you know, so we'll talk about that. What diets have you done before? What worked? What didn't work? Have you met with a dietitian or nutritionist before? What did you like? What didn't you like? Um, you know, and kind of running through that history. Um, and then we talk about just basic logistics. Who do you live with? Who are your support people? Um, do you like grocery shopping? How often do you go grocery shopping? Do you like cooking? How often do you cook? Um, so running through all of that stuff. And then we talk about more lifestyle stuff, right? So we're digging and digging into what does your daily schedule look like? Do you work at home sitting at a computer all day? Are you a doctor and you're running around and you have 30 seconds to shove a granola bar in your mouth, right? Um, and what physical activity, obviously that's a piece that, you know, we'll take into consideration. Then we even go back a little further. How did you eat as a kid? What was life like for you growing up around food? Um, it's important for me to understand what food biases are you bringing in here, right? What did your mom teach you about food? What did your dad teach you about food? What am I fighting against, right? Um, and then we finally get into how are you eating, right? Like what's your day look like? Um, and, and then on the back end, I do all the calculations and figure out, you know, what does this look like? But it may not be a structured plan. It may be, we're starting with small tweaks and I need to see that full picture for me to decide, like, we have a wide range of, of ways we can go about this at the end of the session. And, you know, I need to know that background history before I say, is a structured plan good for you or is a small step good for you, right? Yeah. And that's just the first session, everything that you explained and some subsequent yeah. work after that, which that's, that's quite a deep dive. Just touch briefly on what the, the subsequent sessions look like, because mm -hmm. again, the, the plan is only as good as the ability to actually have it implemented consistently. And I assume that's where those follow-up sessions go, but, but touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So I always, I always leave the first session saying, I do not want you to come in this next session and tell me everything was perfect because I know it won't be right. Like that's first and foremost, you are not going to do these, you know, five goals that we set out perfectly every single day. And I don't expect you to pretend like it did go that way. Right. Um, and so I kind of opened that door for, I, I need you to fail. I need you to have things that don't go well. Cause that's how we, we tweak it and we learn and we get to something better. Um, and I think that one just opens the door for them to be okay with it. Um, I, I know there's situations where people will cancel the follow-up session because they didn't do what we talked about. And I'm like, no, the, that's the whole point of the follow-up session, you know, um, come here and, and talk to me about why it didn't work so that we can figure out how to change it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really how the follow-up session starts is, okay, tell me about it. What, what went well, what didn't go well. And I just kind of opened the floor for them to, you know, some people will give me one word answers, but a lot of times it's a, you know, 15 minute, here's what went well. Here's what didn't go well. Here's what I liked. Here's what I didn't like. This day was hard. This day was easy. Um, and then we dig into it, um, obviously building on the things that are going well. And, you know, if there's a piece of it that did not work, we planned for, you know, a snack midday and work is always too crazy and it never happens. How can we adjust it? Right. Do we, do we switch the timing? Do we come up with some quick, easy ideas that you can bring with you? Um, so yeah, a lot of just kind of digging in. And again, like I said, that's about a 45 minute session, <laughs> you know, so yeah, and and this is it's going to be kind of an impossible question for you to answer, but I think it's important just to provide people some general chronological context. How long are you typically working with maybe your your average client? Yeah, um, yeah, like you said, difficult question, but um, I would say you know at least at least a handful of follow ups. You know, if we're meeting once every couple of weeks or once a month. I would say, you know, the minimal, minimal, when I was doing packages, the minimal I would do is a three month package. Um, and that's like, ideally we're, we're going closer to six months, right? So we're meeting every couple of weeks for three, four five, six months. Um, but I have people I've seen for years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is a complex process of behavior change. It's everyone I think has a general idea of what healthy food choices are and what not so healthy food choices are, but actually implementing those behaviors consistently, it, it, it just takes time. And the reason I wanted to point that out is just what we said earlier. Like if you're going to commit to helping somebody with nutrition, this is not a, a three minute conversation when you're stretching somebody at the end of a session. Right. Uh, this, this is a, a concerted focused effort. 
I do have some topics that I want to get specifically into that I think our audience will really enjoy. But before we get into uh, some greater degree of specificity, I'd just like you to touch on a second how fitness and wellness professionals could start to consider collaborative relationships with you know, dietitians. Like how, how do you, how do we actually make this a, a reality in, in action and, and how do we operationalize this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are a kind of subset of dietitians um, that are certified specialists in sports dietetics. Mm -hmm. um, and this doesn't necessarily mean high level athletes. It can be, but, you know, basically they have done the work, they have worked in the, you know, fitness, um, you know, space, mm -hmm. um, and taken an exam every five years. I'm actually just took my, my second follow-up mm -hmm. one, which I'm so glad to be done for five years. Um, but there's a list, um, uh, online, um, of this CSSD list, um, that's sorted by state. So that's a good place to start because those right. are the people that, you know, are obviously, you know, kind of top choice when it comes to kind of working in that space. Um, but I would say that's not the only, that's not the only option, right? There are many people who, um, who know and, and understand this, um, maybe who are prior athletes or, or, you know, movement science grads. Um, and so the nice thing is that that collaboration is getting to be a very popular mm -hmm. place, right? I work with a lot of students who have interest in working in sports nutrition and wellness nutrition. And so, um, all that to say, there's there's a lot of options out there, right? Um, obviously, checking CSSD is a good place to start, but you know, reaching out to you know local schools if there's a school nearby that has a dietetics program, um, you know, even just you know networking, right? Does anybody else in in your network know of someone? Um, and then once you find someone, meet them. <laughs> I think that's really really important because just like I know in every industry, there are people who know their stuff and there are people who think they know their stuff, right? Um, and it's really, really important to make sure that you sit down and that is a good fit. Um, and I think even beyond that, if you can get a couple people that you're kind of got on your roster, um, I know we kind of compared it to therapy earlier, but, mm -hmm. you know, just like every, one therapist is not going to be a fit for every single person. Same thing with nutrition, right? There's a lot of relationship building that goes into play there. And, um, you know, I may not be the best fit for someone. So if you have someone else that you can say, here's a couple people, test them out, see who fits. I think that's really, really um, a good way to do it. Um, and then the only other recommendation I would make is um, get them in front of your people, right? Um, so if you can schedule, you know, a meet and greet, if you can schedule a, you know, 15 minute question and answer session, if you can schedule a hour long presentation that they come in and do, um, you know, I think that that's really important because when we're some like, you know, faceless person in the background, nobody, nobody wants to see us, right? Um, I know I was fortunate that the couple gyms that I, you know, connected with, um, I, I knew, I knew the clientele. I already was kind of a part of that community and, you know, it was very easy for me to get in, but if you don't, it's, it's, it's tricky to, to form that relationship and help them feel comfortable. So. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll link up to the CSSD, uh, mm -hmm. website so people can search that. And I, I wonder, and I would suspect this is the case, but that the referral relationship to some degree probably works both ways. There are, there are situations where as a dietitian, you're looking to refer somebody out to uh, an exercise or wellness professional. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's where the, the synergy can, can really exist in a relationship like this. And I think we've, we've learned, particularly coming out of the pandemic, that the only way we're going to improve overall population and individual health is if, if we collaborate, because there's, there's a lot of mm -hmm. work to be done. Yes. Let's let's talk through some specific scenarios that I think people will find interesting. And one you, you mentioned very quickly earlier, but I think it's a really interesting discussion. And there's there's a part of me that is excited to bring this up, but there's also a part of me that's worried to bring this up because I feel like we can go for two and a half hours just on this. But a common goal that people walk through the door of a gym with to see a fitness or a wellness professional is a weight loss goal. Mm -hmm. And this podcast is getting released right before January, where those goals are, are more prevalent than what they are at any other point in time during the year. The irony is that exercise is not designed to help you lose weight. Like weight loss is a, is a side effect of exercise. It's not a direct effect. But even interventions dietarily that are designed to help people lose weight turn out to not be incredibly effective, at least from a maintenance perspective. Yeah. And 
there's this concept of weight neutrality that exists out there, uh, or you know, a non-diet approach that a lot mm -hmm. of dietitians seem to gravitate towards. And I think people would find this interesting. So can you speak on that philosophy of a non-diet yes. approach and kind of being a little bit more you know, weight agnostic in your practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this is such a, it, it makes me so happy that this is becoming more commonplace. And I mean, I know I remember back in schooling being like, I'm going to write a book on, you know, eating without dieting. And now all of a sudden it's everywhere. And I'm like, oh yes, this is, this is, these are my people. Um, and so, you know, exactly what you said, when it comes to maintenance, you know, study after study after study proves that, you know, following a structured weight loss plan may work, right. But for how long, right. And, um, so I think that's really this non-diet approach is basically coming into it and saying, we're not going to try to lose weight. We're not going to restrict foods. We're not going to, you know, give you very specific, you know, requirements that you have to do. Um, we're going to teach you how to eat in a way, you know, as I always say that, that fuels your body, um, and fuels your mind. Right. And, and sets you up to, you know, again, kind of pulling into that mental health piece. Um, you know, I say over and over to people who come in and say, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. And I said, how did it make you feel? Right. How did you feel while you were doing those? And I don't think I've ever had someone say, oh, I felt mentally great. <laughs> right. Like, um, and mental health is physical health. When, mm -hmm. when your mental health is impacted, when your social life is impacted, and we all know that the last year and a half has been hard from a social perspective. And you know, now that people are starting to be able to do stuff again, if, if you feel like you can't go out to a restaurant because they don't have the foods that fit your specific diets, how's that impacting your life, right? Um, so really this is where, again, I, I could probably, you're right, go off for, for hours on this, but um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that people are starting to embrace this. I think that the idea of you know taking weight, um, as I like to say, and kind of putting it on the top shelf, right? Mm -hmm. We're not saying that you know, your weight will never change or you should never have, you know, goals that, you know, are physical, but it doesn't need to be that kind of front and center goal. Um, because really you can't change that, right? Like, and, and there are things you can do that may change it, but you can't walk into a gym, like you said, and say, I want to lose 10 pounds and boom, it happens. Right. What you can do is you can, you know, change the way you're moving your body you can change your eating patterns. You can adjust your relationship with food. You can work on that piece. And those things may change your weight. True. But in that sense, it's kind of like that, um, you know, like I said, it's on the top shelf. It's, it's still there somewhere in the background, but it's not our, you know, front main picture. Yeah. And I've always thought that weight loss is a tough goal and weight maintenance is even tougher because it's not a proximal goal. Like if I'm looking to lose 20 pounds, that's not in the immediate future, but yet the piece of pizza is in front of me right now. And we tend to gravitate more towards things that are, are instantly gratifying. And you said something that I think is important, but I just want to have you clarify it a little more. This approach doesn't suggest that having a weight loss goal is bad or losing weight is a bad thing. Correct. Maybe clarify that a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. So, you know, again, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of schools of thought on this, right? And, and absolutely, you know, first and foremost, I want people to feel comfortable in their bodies, right? And, you know, my ideal goal is that we can take weight and have that not be the thing that makes you feel comfortable or uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's work that we'll do in sessions. That's work that I often suggest go to therapy, work on this piece. Mm -hmm. Don't make weight be your, your thing that defines mm -hmm. you, right? Um, because I think that's an important key with this, mm -hmm. but um, you know, sometimes that is, is a goal and we have to meet people where they are. Right. And so, you know, I think it's important to understand that, um, it's not saying that it will never happen or it can't happen, or, you know, you, you need to like throw that in the trash and, and completely, you know, ignore that that is out there in the society. Right. Um, I, I wish we could wipe all of, you know, weight focus and diet culture out of our, you know, society, but, um, but we're not going to do that right now. And so sometimes, you know, it's important to kind of, you know, meet people where they're at and, and recognize that that, that can be a goal, but we just need to take it and, and put, throw it away for a little bit. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't have to be a, 
a thing you don't worry about at all, but it's not something you're emphasizing as it sounds like what right. you're saying. Um, I, I do, I'll go one layer deeper and then we'll move on. Uh, I think you, you mentioned that the reality is, is we're not gonna, we're not gonna remove it from our society right now. And diet culture is very present. Can you just touch on that very quickly of, you know, how, how that shows up and why it's not so easy to erase? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's everywhere. And I talk often that like, it's like you're walking upstream, right? Like you are going to be walking upstream and you're constantly going to be getting these messages from media, um, from, from Instagram, from TikTok, from school, from work, you know, comments from friends, from colleagues, you know, pictures at the gym, um, that say that if you're in a smaller body, life will be better. Right. Um, and so we, we can't, we can't like erase all of that. Um, unfortunately, but, um, I think it's, you know, important to know that there is an alternative to that. And I do think it's getting better. I think, you know, with, like I said, that anti-diet, you know, thing becoming big in the tr nutrition world and hopefully filtering down to everyone else. And, um, I think things are starting to improve, you know, more body positivity and, and people being open and accepting, you know, more body types. Um, but it's, it's constantly going to be an uphill battle with comments from, you know, grandma and, you know, things like that. So. Yeah. And I'll remind our listeners back to Dr. Sonneville's episode on weight stigma. I believe it was two or three episodes ago. Now, maybe episode 26, where we, we talked a little bit more about this. And, and she said something in that episode that really stuck out at me. And I, I just more want to relay it, not looking for any response, but she said she walked into a workplace uh, as a dietitian that was giving a, just a lunch and learn lecture. And the person that she introduced herself to as the dietitian said, oh, wow, I'd expect you to be thinner being a dietitian. And yeah. this woman is in very good shape. She's very fit. She's a very appropriate, healthy body weight. And even weight stigma affected her in that moment, which I, I found mm -hmm. to be such a, a fascinating and also a, a very sad commentary on how, just how pervasive this is. Yeah. The mental health piece is something that you touched on. And I think the, justifiably so, this is becoming a much more common conversation in our society. Talk for a second on the, the prevalence of disordered eating, eating disorders, that spectrum. I tend to think this is out there far more than what is truly clinically diagnosed. And mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk about it from the perspective of a fitness or wellness professional listening to this and maybe being able to pick up on some of the potential symptomology of that to, as a red flag for potential referral. Yeah, definitely. Um, and exactly like you said, I mean, there are definitely the, the clinically diagnosable, you know, anorexia, bulimia, you know, things that, that you often hear about when you hear about eating disorders, um, you know, extreme restriction, binging, purging, that kind of thing. Um, but then there's that, that sub layer, right. Um, where it's just subclinical, you know, the disordered eating behaviors, um, orthorexia, which is, you know, kind of this extreme, you know, I like to say like the clean eating, you know, um, but, but going beyond, you know, just wanting to improve wellness, um, and, and, you know, really into some sort of like obsession and anxiety around food, um, even, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that things like, you know, constantly jumping from fad diet to fad diet to fad diet, you know, how detrimental that is. Um, you know, we kind of touched on that earlier from a mental and physical perspective. So I feel very, very strongly like, and I've seen this over and over that the vast majority of our culture, you know, going back to that diet culture piece has some level of disordered eating behaviors, right? Um, I think that, you know, I've met very, very few people who I would say are 100%, you know, healthy relationship with food in their body. Um, and so, you know, what do you guys look for, right? Like, what is, what it, what do you kind of notice where it kind of tips into that? Maybe it's not clinically diagnosable, but, but where it's something you would want to refer out. And you know, obviously there's, there's the verbal stuff, right? Like, you know, the constant talking about wanting to lose weight or, or, you know, very obviously negative body image, um, obsessive about their food, their eating, their, you know, counting, weighing, you know, um, those are things that you, you may hear, right. Um, those are kind of, you know, first obvious signs. Um, but then looking at the physical stuff too, right. Um, I mean, obviously there's the obvious stuff of extreme weight loss. Um, you know, that would be definitely an, an indicator. Um, 
but even things like just general fatigue, talking about being tired all the time, um, you know, needing to drink that extra cup of coffee in the afternoon, um, you know, coffee isn't giving your body fuel, that's not going to help you, right? Um, you know, loss of strength, um, trouble making progress, you know, in their performance, um, whatever that might be, right? Um, even frequent injuries and illnesses, constantly being sick, um, stress fractures are a huge indicator um, that, you know, nutritionally, they're not getting what they need to get. Um, so, you know, those are things that will come up, right? And that, that you may be the first one to kind of notice, like, Hey, you're dragging here in the gym. What did you eat before you came? What have you eaten the rest of the day? Right. Um, cause you'll sometimes get people who will, okay, I'm going to the gym. So I know I need to eat right now, but they're eating for the first time at 4 PM and haven't eaten anything since, you know, maybe a small dinner the night before. Right. So, um, those are definitely points where it's, it's a good idea to, if you feel like you have a relationship with them where you can say, Hey, I'm concerned, you know, um, I'm concerned about the way you're fueling your body and, um, hopefully you, you can, you know, suggest meeting with a dietitian, someone who, um, knows this, right. I mean, not all, di all dietitians are going to be equipped to manage that, but someone who has experience and specializes in eating disorders, um, that'd be a great place to refer. Yeah. It seems like it, it is a bit of a delicate conversation because it, it does start to kind of evolve into the realm of psychology, but do you have any, based on your observations or experiences, any suggestions as to how to like specifically broach that topic or maybe what good language would be to use if you are a fitness or wellness professional looking to make the referral in more of a disordered eating or eating disordered situation? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think what I found, you know, time and time again, especially you guys are in a situation where um, this person obviously wants to perform better from, mm -hmm. from a fitness perspective um, and they're there and that performance matters. Right. So this is something, you know, I found in working with a lot of athletes, they don't care that, you know, they are, you know, feeling sluggish during the day. They, they may not care that there's physical effects that may happen, you know, internally, but they do care about their performance, mm -hmm. right. They care about how they're performing. So sometimes that can be as much as I want them to care about all the other stuff. Sometimes pulling in that performance piece can be almost like a safe gateway, right. To get in. So kind of pulling it back to that, Hey, like, you know, I can tell your, your strength has, has come down a lot. Um, you know, I'm concerned about how you're feeling your body. Um, you know, maybe touching base with someone who can help you through this. Right. Um, so I think that can sometimes be kind of a safe place, um, to start, uh, they're less likely to get defensive uh -huh. about that or to say, no, it's not a problem or no, I'm not, you know, um, concerned about this. Um, because a lot of times there is some that, some of that denial that may come in. Yeah, I like that. That seems like a very um, non-confrontational way to to bring this up. That doesn't kind of have that that negative charge to it. That's uh, very insightful. You mentioned uh, orthorexia earlier, and I think it, it's good to unpack that a little bit more. And I say that largely in part because I think a lot of orthorexic individuals, particularly in the eyes of fitness and wellness professionals, are the rock star clients. They're like, "Wow, look at." look at Tim or look at Tina, like, man, they just, they listen to everything that I have to say. And they're so on point, but mm -hmm. there becomes a point where enough of a good thing can become a not so good thing. And that, that seems like what orthorexia devolves towards. So just, just touch on orthorexia a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I think unfortunately, exactly what you said, it, it's sometimes praised, right. Um, mm -hmm. and orthorexia, you know, like I said, is this just kind of obsession with, the clean eating, the types of foods that you're eating, um, and, you know, really staying away from any sort of junk food or processed food. Um, and I like to, you know, I, I always tell people when I meet with them for the first time, like, this may seem crazy to hear from a dietitian, but there's no such thing as a good food or a bad food, unless it's spoiled or there's mold on it, then we can call it a bad food. Right. Um, and, you know, really, I like to kind of focus on more, there are foods for your body. Absolutely. I, I cannot argue that there are foods that are going to provide good quality lean protein or a ton of vitamins or a ton of minerals or good fiber for your body. Right. So we, we can talk about that. Yes. From a scientific level, there are definitely foods that provide more of those nutrients than others, but that doesn't mean those other foods are, are unclean or, or dirty foods or bad foods because they also provide benefits to us, right? Or they should, um, they may be your, your mom's favorite chocolate chip recipe or, you know, your pancakes that you make on, on Sunday morning 
not with bananas and not with protein powder, but like actual pancakes, <laughs> you know, that you eat with your kids. And um, those are those are important from a mental standpoint, right? And we've kind of come back to this mental health a handful of times, but um, that's really where that that key comes in is if you only eat foods for your body all day long, your mind is not going to be healthy, right? Um, just like we may say, if you only eat foods for your mind all day long, your body may not feel as good, right? Um, so there has to be a balance and and that's really kind of true healthy eating, right? As being able to find that balance between um, feeling good physically and feeling good mentally, um, you know, not having it disrupt your life or cause more stress or cause more anxiety um, because we got enough other things in our lives that can cause stress and anxiety. We don't need to have food be a piece of that, right? Yes, particularly for those of us that are food secure living in the industrialized world. There, there are people who have legit stress and anxiety because of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. if, yes. if, if, you're, if you're deciding between the organic chicken breast and the regular chicken breast, and that's, that's a stressor for you, I think that that's a, a sign that maybe you need to take a step back and evaluate things. I'm so mm -hmm. glad that we talked about that because I do think it is, it's such an important area for people to start to consider. And I think one thing that it highlights is this misconception that I feel like is, is definitely came out of certainly like the bodybuilding and the physique community, which is that you know, food is just fuel for your body. Food is just fuel for your body. And that's not an accurate statement. Like there is a, no. there is a psychological component and that's not necessarily more important, but it's certainly as important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, whew. We've talked about some heavy stuff. Uh, so yeah. I, I want to, before we get to the last couple of questions, I want to end with a little bit more lighthearted of a question, which is uh, just very quickly, your, your view on supplements as, as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of fitness and wellness professionals will recommend supplements. Uh, some of them may even sell them and we can, you know, setting that bias aside. How do you view the use of dietary supplements for the people that you work with? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think this is one area where I've, I've kind of, my views have shifted over my, you know, decade plus of, of doing this. I think initially when I came in, I was very food, only food, never touch a supplement, like cut them all out, throw them in the trash. Right. Um, and I'm not going to say that I've like done a 180 because that's, that's not true. A hundred percent, still a food first um, perspective mm -hmm. and a hundred percent, you can get everything you need to be a fully functioning human from food, right? Um, supplements are not necessary in any, you know, grand scheme sort of way. Um, but that being said, there are, again, this is a meeting people where they're at, right? If somebody comes to me and says, Hey, I want to take this supplement. Um, I'm going to talk to them about it, right? I'm going to first and foremost, is your food intake where it needs to be? Are you eating the foods, you know, all of the nutrients you need to be eating? Are you eating enough? Are you eating at the right times? Um, you know, those are the first pieces that we need to, you know, that's the bottom of the pyramid that we need to make sure that's there. Um, are you getting enough sleep? Are you doing your recovery the way that you should? Um, are you taking rest days? You know, I mean, those are all pieces that are a part of the puzzle. If that's all check, 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 then, then maybe, maybe we can talk about that little top, mm -hmm. top piece of the pyramid that is supplements. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, I'm going to want people to choose ones that have been 30 third party tested, um, which, you know, I can also provide, you know, some links for that, but NSF, um, is one of the big ones and that's actually local to, you know, the Ann Arbor Ipsy area. Um, but they make sure that there's no, no banned substances. If that's something that, you know, matters for people, no contaminants, the manufacturing process practices are appropriate um, for the companies. Um, so I would definitely steer people towards that. Um, and then, you know, some of the kind of newer supplements, you know, my usual, usual line is it, it probably is not going to hurt you if you're picking one that's, you know, been tested and, and, you know, we're there, but it may not help either, but if you have extra money to spend and everything else is in line and you feel like this is going to give you that extra benefit, then just know that it's not a guarantee, right? So um, that's that's usually kind of the, the last piece. Yeah, that's great. Well, and right in the in the name implies what it is. It is a supplement to, not in replacement of a, a diet. And I'm the, the statement you just made about uh, if it, it might, it's probably not going to hurt you. It might help you, and if you want to spend the money, go for it. I I've heard many people in the dietetics and sport nutrition community say that, and I think that's a that, that is a reasonable, I think, mental model to use. But to mm -hmm. your point, 
you know, make sure it is a quality product that is tested. And I, I'm also happy to hear you brought up NSF because we had David Trozen, who is the program manager for testing at NSF for their Certified State for Sport program as a guest on the podcast in our early days. And so that's definitely an episode if you want to dive more into that. Uh, but we will also link up to uh, those some of those third party resources that are out there because, um, you know, buyer beware with dietary supplements. There's not, not a lot of, lot, a lot of great regulation out there on them, but that was a very, very useful perspective for how fitness and wellness professionals could look at supplements. Well, Allison, uh, we're coming to a close here and I want people to find out more about how they can find out about it, things you're doing, where you're at, where are you at on social media or on the internet? Where, where are good places to go to find out? Yeah, definitely. So my website, um, www.leveluprd.com, that has pretty much everything, um, has my social social links in there as well. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely provide that um, so that you can share that. Um, and then, you know, you can follow my Eastern Michigan Eagles as well. Um, we have a, a Instagram page um, that we run for the athletes there at Eastern um, that I can share as well too. Awesome. That'd be great. And we'll link up to all that on the show notes page. So everyone has a chance to check that out. And, and before we end, I'll end this podcast with the question that I ask all of my guests, which is to a degree, the unanswerable question, but maybe every time we get a little bit closer to an answer, uh, I view the wellness paradox. The title of the podcast is this, this gap, this, this trust gap, communication gap, interaction gap between fitness and wellness professionals and the, the larger medical and allied health community. From your standpoint, if you were to advise those fitness and wellness professionals to do one thing to close that gap off, what would that one thing be? I think definitely build your network, right? Know, know your scope, know when to refer out um, and, and find those people that can help, you know, bridge that gap and, and fill in the holes for you. Awesome. Well, Allison Mankowski, this has been a spectacular conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Great work. That was awesome. Cool. That went Thanks. a bunch of different directions, but it was, yeah. it was good. You, uh, you do a very, very good job as an interviewee of making your point accurately and succinctly, which allowed me to get to more questions. Some, some people will, and I'm like one of these people, I'll just keep droning on and on and on. Yeah. It's like, Mike, that's enough already. But yeah, that was great. We got into a lot of good stuff. So I will yeah. link up to your website. Um, the NSF link, I, I have that. I'll link up to yeah. that. Uh, the CSS, if you could send me that uh, link yep, I will. CSSD, and anything else you can think of, we'll throw that on the show notes page. My, my team will get on cutting this up and getting it all put together on the show notes page. We'll probably have that out to you middle to end of next week. You'll have a chance to review it before we awesome. post it to go live. And then if there's any comments or changes you'd like to make to the page, team's happy to do that. And then, as Perfect. I said, we'll get you the social media assets and anything that you can share with your network. But yeah, this awesome. was great. I mean, I, I, I definitely request uh, some additional podcasts in the future for us to dive into to some yes. of these other issues a little more because we just, we just touched the surface of some things that I really enjoy talking about. I know I was like, oh, I could talk for like forever about this. I'm going to try to like narrow it down. Um, I was really excited to see. I actually listened to the one with Kendra last night because I was yeah. like scrolling through and I was like, oh, you talked to Kendra. Um, yeah, okay. I actually you, worked with her lab. Okay. So yeah, yeah she, she was great. She was actually connected to me by an AFS client, Sarah Ball. Okay. I don't know if you know Sarah yes. at the School of Public Health. Yep. Sarah used one of my podcasts that I did early on for one of her classes. And then I said, hey, okay. is there anyone I should talk to at the School of Public Health? And that she introduced, uh, hooked me up with Kendra. And that was just a, again, that was another conversation I could have gone for hours yep. and hours on. But I feel like there's a, there's good momentum behind this, this movement of kind of destigmatizing larger body size. And, yes. and I hope like I'm actually working on a messaging campaign with the Michigan fitness clubs association, which is the trade association for fitness clubs in the state. And that's part of what I'm working for us to do is like, Hey, let's that's talk awesome. about, let's not talk about getting ripped for summer anymore. Like, can, can we start yeah. to talk about something else? But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think, I think it's moving in a good direction. We, we, people have to have more conversation around it. We just need more awareness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I was excited. I'm glad you did something with her. So yeah, it was great. Well, man, this was awesome. Um, I guess last thing is I think you got a referral from John Evans, an athlete, yes. which is yes. great. I, I think that'll be a, an awesome 
relationship for the yeah. three of you. One thing that we should think about, and I don't know when and how we would do this, but it seems like we could do a pretty cool workshop at some point with you know, me as a strength and conditioning professional, you as a sport dietitian, and John as a performance psychologist. So I'll just, I'll, yeah. I'll plant the seed on that. And you know, maybe that's a, a spring or a summer thing when athletes yeah. are out of school. But I, th I think there'd be a lot of interest in something like that. And I, I think it could be a, a really, really cool offering to either you know, professionals or to mm -hmm. just the, the, the general public. So you know, put, put some, put some thought into that. We might be able to figure out a way to do something cool there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We had, I had a like quick little, like half hour convo with him, um, with John and I was like, okay, my, my goals for 2022 are to like build some things, like yeah. do some stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be awesome. I'd be a hundred percent in for that. Sweet. Awesome. Well, I will get you the cool. show notes page. You can get me all that jazz over there. Thank you so much for doing this. And yeah. thank you for, for talking to my class. They loved it. I'm definitely going to hopefully be able to use you as a, as a standing resource in that class every fall, because I think it's, it's I'd be happy to. to hear about it. But if you ever need anything from me, please don't hesitate to give me a shout. Always, always have, happy to help out in your world. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Yep. Happy holidays. You too. Bye. Bye. yesterday And welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness and wellness professionals and our broader allied health community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest most evidence-based and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that today in episode number 32, we're joined by Allison Mankowski. I don't know if this is 32, fuck me. Okay, this is 29, 30, 31, 32, it is 32. And welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you've joined us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, communication, and interaction gap between fitness and wellness professionals and the larger allied health and medical communities. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that in episode 32, I'm joined by Allison Mankowski, who's a registered dietitian. This conversation is largely going to be around the interaction and collaboration that can exist between dietetics professionals and fitness and wellness professionals. Certainly, this is going to evolve into a discussion around scope of practice and what fitness and wellness professionals should consider in terms of counseling with regard to nutrition with their clients and what should be referred out. And as Allison will mention, there's certain things that without a doubt, fitness and wellness professionals can absolutely counsel on basic healthy eating principles. There's other things that fitness and wellness professionals 
won't understand that they have the ability to counsel on properly, like certain clinical conditions, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. But there is this messy middle ground that exists, as Allison will discuss, for a whole host of clients and goals that really caused the question to be brought up, when should the referral take place to a dietetics professional and what should that look like? We'll also dive into some other things such as orthorexia, uh, weight neutrality, diet culture, and we'll look a little bit under the hood of what actually happens in a dietetics practice when a dietitian is coaching a client. I think this will be a fascinating look under that hood, but more importantly, should shed some light on how a collaboration between fitness and wellness professionals and dietetics professionals can take place. Any additional information that we'd like to share from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode three, two. Please enjoy this conversation with Allison Mankowski. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Allison as much as I did. If you found it insightful or informative, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares make a massive difference for us. Any information that we'd like to share with you from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode three, two. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And please don't forget to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platforms. Those reviews are so critical to helping us grow this podcast and our audience. Until we chat again next week, please. Be well.